it was supposed to be a day of mourning, a day of defeat. It was a day for the critics and skeptics to point the finger with smug satisfaction and declare, your savior was a fraud. His death has proven it. He is buried, he is gone, and he will be forgotten. It was supposed to be a day of darkness and a day of grief. A day when broken and confused followers felt lost and overwhelmed with hopelessness. Even those who went to visit the tomb that day expected to find nothing more than a lifeless body. It was supposed to be a day of sadness and weeping. But you transformed it into a day of rejoicing, a day of victory, a day when the children of God can shout with confidence, He is alive, He is risen, and He will never be forgotten. This day has driven out all darkness and grief, erased all sin and shame, a day when followers of the true Savior are flooded with purpose, promises, and hope. This day echoes through the halls of history as the day our King crushed the head of the snake, tore through the chains of death itself, and claimed mankind for His kingdom. Tears of despair have become tears of overwhelming joy. For the Lord, Jesus Christ has made this day of sorrow into a day of worship. Good morning. Welcome to our Resurrection Sunday. And we are here gathered worshiping the Lord only by His grace. You and I are here basking in His goodness only by His grace. So this morning, we are inviting you to join us as we celebrate the resurrected Christ, as we celebrate our redemption, our salvation, that only in Him that we are saved. So join me in prayer and we will worship the Lord this morning as a family, as a church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you have loved us so much that you came to die on the cross for our sins, dying the death that we should have died, paying the price, Lord, that we could not pay. Father, thank you for redeeming us, for saving us. And this morning, Lord, we celebrate your goodness, your grace, you have shown us that your death is for our life and you have resurrected for our new life. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for showing your grace. And this morning, Lord, as a church, as a family, we are gathered to worship you. May you be in our midst and may the songs that we sing, may our hearts as we worship and fellowship together be acceptable to you. Lord, we love you. We glorify you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
A blessed morning to everyone. Thank God for this another opportunity to worship Him. Even if we're far from each other, we can still worship Him. As we start, let me first read this very familiar verse to us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This verse may be very common to us, but I hope and pray that we will always remember that Christ took the blame and bore the wrath for us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship you freely. Thank you for the protection, provision, and security you have given us. Prepare our hearts and minds, Lord, as we sing songs of praises to you and as we listen to your word through your servant. Remove the distractions, O Lord, that will hinder us to focus on you alone. We bring you back all the glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us sing this song, Power of the Cross, as we reflect on how God loves us. To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful man, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross. Of
The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your son Drank the bitter cup reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once you're in a
Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service. Today, we are celebrating the Resurrection Sunday. So welcome, everyone, to this uh, live broadcast. Wherever you are this very moment, it's my prayer that uh, you are all settled and uh, your hearts are filled with joy and thanksgiving as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday today. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of remembering that we serve, that we worship the true and a living Lord. In spite of what's happening around us today, remember that we have a living Lord. He is alive and He is with us. He walks with us. It's a time of celebration indeed. As the song says, as the, we, the choir, just sung a while ago, He is risen indeed. He is risen. Our Lord did not remain dead after he died for our sins. He was risen from the grave. So as we start, let us bow down our heads. Let's come to the Lord. Let's entrust this time before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord God, with much praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord. As we remember that today, Lord God, we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for us but did not remain dead, rose again from the grave for our justification, rose again from the grave to demonstrate, to show to us that indeed you are what you claim to be. You are God. You are the living Lord. That you are always with your people. Today, God, as we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, Father, fill us with your love. Fill us with that joy in our hearts, Lord God. Fill us with that attitude of celebration, Lord. Knowing, Father, that our Lord has conquered the world has conquered the grave, has conquered death. That even death could not hold him. And so with that same promise, Lord, since we serve, we worship the Lord who is living, we as your people, when our time will come, your promise, resurrection for those who died in Christ. That's why, Lord, indeed in you we are more than conquerors. We are victorious, Lord God. Whatever's happening around us today, Lord God, things might not look good around, and yet, Lord, we praise you because you are alive, Lord God. And you are actively moving in our midst, in the lives of your people. Be with us, Lord, today, even as we reflect upon your word, Lord God. I pray that we will be challenged, Lord God, to serve you the more, Lord. Whatever challenges we might face in this life, whatever trials we might face in this world, Lord, may we have that courage and inspiration, Lord God that, Lord, you will never leave us. You are alive. You are with your people. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So, happy resurrection once again. It's time of celebration. I remember that uh, this story, just right after the World War II, a Methodist uh, leader named William Sangster contracted a disease that eventually or gradually made him paralyzed and has affected his voice. Later, he lost his voice and his condition became worse and worse. That uh, one Sunday, one resurrection Sunday, that was his last resurrection Sunday on earth. His daughter visited him in the hospital 
and he asked for a pen. And he wrote something on a paper. And he wrote these words. He said, how terrible to wake up on Resurrection Day and have no voice to shout, He is risen. He is risen. He paused after that. And yet, he, write, he wrote again, continued on writing. He said, far worse to have a voice and not want to shout. Far worse to have a voice and not want to shout. How terrible to wake up one Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and you have no voice to shout, although you want to shout that he is risen. But it's worse when you have the voice, as we have the voices today, and yet our hearts don't want to celebrate, don't want to shout the victory that we obtain through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is risen indeed. But just what does it mean for us believers today? This happened many, many years ago. But today, in this time of history, what does it mean to us? brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'd like to answer that question as I look into the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, Paul cited three times the great implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in each one's lives, in believers' lives. So let me read first, first uh, portion in the book of Romans. That's in chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 okay or we will be reading uh, up to verse verse 5 okay romans okay. so we find that here in this passage it says that paul a servant of christ jesus called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. And if we continue on verse 6, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So the first thing here that we find, why should I say that Resurrection Sunday is celebrating the empty tomb? During the Resurrection Sunday, what the apostles found, what the people, the followers of Jesus Christ found, is the empty tomb. An empty tomb, but not empty promises. An empty tomb, but not empty promises. You know, the first thing we find here is that the empty tomb, or the resurrection gives us the confirmation of Christ's identity. The first thing we find here is that the empty tomb or the resurrection gives us the confirmation of Christ's identity. Paul begins his letter in uh, the book of Romans in chapter 1. He begins this letter by saying or citing the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might ask the question, how do we know that Jesus was human being, was a man? Well, the Apostle Paul says here that he descended from the line of David. He was from the seed of David, that he became a man. And how do we know how do we know that he is God, he is divine? 
And the Apostle Paul says here, by his resurrection, that he resurrected from the grave. His resurrection confirms what he claimed to be, that he is God. His resurrection confirms of his identity, who he is. Before his death, before his arrest, before his death, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 2, verse 19, he says that destroy this temple, he was referring to his body, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. He says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, he said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he taught also in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he taught that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and killed. After three days, he will rise again. That's what he claimed before his arrest, before his crucifixion, before his death. That he will be killed, he will be arrested, he will be killed. And yet he said, after three days, I will rise again. I will rise again. And this empty tomb, the resurrection, would just confirm what he claimed who he was. What he claimed to be. That he is God. People have the misconception. People many times have misconceptions that religious leaders claim to be God. That is not true, however. For example, Moses, or Abraham, Moses, the founder of uh, um, Judaizer, or Ju Judaism, never claimed to be God. Apostles. Even Muhammad did not claim to be Allah. Buddha never claimed to be God. Only Jesus claimed to be God. But with his claim, how can we validate his claim that he is indeed God? Paul says here with the passage that we read, Paul says through his resurrection. Before his death, before his arrest, he said he will be betrayed, he will be killed, and yet after that, after three days, he will rise again. And the Bible tells us that indeed Jesus rose again from the grave. Empty tomb is a confirmation of his identity that he is not just human being. He is God. He is a savior. He is God. In this passage, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, we also find that He is the one. He is the promised one. In the Old Testament, the Bible speaks of the coming of the Messiah. The Bible speaks of the suffering of the Messiah, the Savior that would come. You can find it in Isaiah chapter 53. The Bible plainly talks about this promised Messiah in the Old Testament. It's foretold in the Old Testament. And also in this passage, in uh, Romans chapter 1, 1 to 5, we find that he is the powerful one. He is not just the promised one from the seed of David who would come to be the Messiah, but he is also the powerful one. Look at the, the term being used here that he is the son of God. Look at his position. He is the son of God. He is the son of God. He is God himself. He is God himself coming to earth and became a man. 
I'd like to cite from Philippians chapter 2, which is familiar to us. Verse five, it starts with verse 5. It says, Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the, the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, this God came to this earth and became a man, became a servant, humbled himself, emptied himself, though he was God, and yet he emptied himself and became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. He is the powerful one because he is not just human being. He is also God. He is 100% human being as what we see in the Bible. And yet he is also 100% God. He is also the performing one. If you look at verse 5, I like this. It says in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are who, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. He is also the performing ones. In here, verse 5 and 6, we find that through him, through the resurrected Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have received grace. We have experienced and received that grace. And not just grace, but we have also received gifts. Paul says here that, in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. He is saying that he received this gift of apostleship, the, the grace, the, the gift of apostleship, calling to be an apostle to serve the Lord. So this is, it's the same with us believers, every one of us, that we have received grace because of Jesus Christ, and we have also received the gifts. Each of us have been gifted by God, have been given something for us to be able to be of service to Him. It's just sad that some believers believe that, or some people believe that, you know, witnessing, winning souls, ministry are just for those paid uh, stuff in the church. But the Bible is very clear that we are all called to serve the Lord because we have not just only received grace, but we also have received gifts. Each of us have something to serve, have something to give to the Master, to use for the glory of His name for the strengthening, the building up of the body of Christ, and for the salvation of those lost souls out there. You and I are called to serve. We receive not just grace through Jesus Christ, but through Jesus Christ, we have also received gift or gifts for, the use, for us to use in His service. So, first thing we find is that the empty tomb gives us the confirmation of his identity, that he is the promised one, the Messiah. Three things mentioned, he is, the, he is Jesus, he is the Christ, and he is the Lord. He is the Christ, he is the anointed one, the promised Messiah that would come, and he is the Lord. He is the promised one. And he is the powerful one. 
because He is Himself the Son of God. And He is also the performing ones. The performing one. He was the one who gave us the grace and gives each believer the gift to use for the glory of His name to be used to serve Him. The second thing is that the empty tomb gives us the promise of cancellation of our sins penalty. The empty tomb. The empty tomb means cancellation of sins penalty. Look at verse 4, chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. The word of God says, Jesus Christ our Lord, or Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. He was delivered up for our trespasses and he raised up, or he was raised for our salvation. I like this from uh, commentary from BKC or the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It says, in, uh, based on this verse, he said, it says there that Christ's death as God's sacrificial lamb was to pay the redemptive price for the sins of all people so that God might be free to forgive those who respond by faith to that provision. Christ's resurrection was the proof or demonstration and vindication of God's acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice. Thus, because he lives, God can credit his provided righteousness to the account of every person who responds by faith to that offer. Christ's death means the consolation of our sins penalty. Remember that the empty or the dead Christ can save nobody. A dead Christ can save no one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 19, the Bible tells us there that if Christ did not raise from the dead, our faith is futile and that we still remained in our sins and it says if Jesus Christ did not rise again from the dead then our hope as believers is only found here on this earth and nothing more he says that if Christ did not raise from the dead, we are to be the most pitied people. See? A dead Christ can save, can save no one, can save nobody. But we thank the Lord that Christ did not remain dead. After he died for our sin, the Bible says that he rose again for our justification. A dead Christ can save nobody. Believers have future inheritance in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And the following, we have here that the believers have a future inheritance because of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the inheritance. And I would like to read this passage uh, for us. First Peter. First Peter chapter, chapter uh, 1, uh, starting with verse, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What a wonderful promise that believers, that because of Christ's resurrection, because of His resurrection, that we as believers, we are saved from our sin because He did not remain dead. And we as believers, we have this future inheritance as what is described here by the Apostle Peter. This inheritance is for us ready to be revealed in the proper time. And not just that, also in First Thessalonians chapter 4, 14 to 18, we find that we have this promise that we will meet as believers who have died. We will once again meet as believers who have died. In other words, I'm, death will not be the end will not be the final destiny for those who have relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sad about uh, some of my friends uh, lately, no, no, some friends whose loved ones have died, have passed away. Uh, but what a promise we have here in First Thessalonians 4, 14 to 18, that we as believers, when we give our goodbyes to our loved ones who have died, the Bible says that that was just a temporary goodbye because we will be seeing each other again in heaven. We have the promise of eternal life in heaven, that we will be together up there in heaven. And also we have this promise that because Christ did not remain dead, we have this promise that our Christian ministry is not in vain. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, 50 to 58, Paul talks about the hardships. Paul talks about death here. And he says, O oh, death, where is your sting? That death has no power over the lives of believers anymore. That whatever happens in our life, either we live or we die serving the Lord, the Apostle Paul says, the Bible says here, that we should remain strong and movable because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why? Because even though we might sacrifice for the Lord, even to the point of giving up our life for the Lord, he says that all things will not be in vain that is done for the Lord. Because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why? Because we have hope. Why? Because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because our Lord Jesus Christ did not remain dead. He is risen for us. And the last is that the empty tomb gives us the celebration of life eternal. In verse, chapter 8, verse 1 of Romans, it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, let me read this for us. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a promise for us believers. What a promise for us. That if we have the same spirit, spirit of God, 
is with us. It says that the same, in the same way that Jesus Christ was rose from the dead, then we believers also will experience that resurrection of the body. Let me quote that again in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 to 17. I really like this passage. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died on the, and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Three things I'd like to cite in this wonderful passage. One is that for us believers, for those people who have died in the Lord, the Bible says that there is that reception in heaven, that you will be received up there in heaven, the moment of death. Take note of that. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And if we move on, it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive during the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, we will also be caught up in the air and we will be meeting our loved ones who have died ahead of us and we will be together with the Lord forever and ever. What a wonderful promise. Three things we find here in this passage. One is that there is a reception in heaven. Second is that there is the resurrection from the dead. And the third one is that there is reunion, a great reunion in heaven. And that reunion is twofold reunion. One is that we will be united with our Lord in heaven and we will be reunited with our loved ones who have gone ahead of us. I pray that for those ones, brothers and sisters, who have just lost or whose loved ones have just died or passed away, I hope this passage will, or this scripture will bring comfort to us that there is the promise of reception in heaven, that there is the resurrection from the dead, and there is that reunion up there in heaven. Praise God. So for us believers today, how wonderful it is to know that we are serving a true and a living Lord, a living Savior. He is with us. If you look around today because of this pandemic, everything might seem dark and everything might seem uncertain. We thought that the pandemic will just go for months, but now it's more than a year already. Just last month, we celebrated that one month or one year na yung lockdown natin, the first week of March. And today, we are fearing that uh, uh, mas maglala because in, in Manila, um, mas grabe na yung cases. And it says that at least there are four variants na ng virus na nakapasok sa Pilipinas. And the spread is going so fast. And every day, the number of infected people are growing in number. It's sad. And many times, it causes us to worry. But friends, the Bible reminds us that we serve 
a living God, a living Lord. And I hope that we'll be reminded that whatever happens along the way, God will do what he promised to us when he said that I will be with you even to the ends of the earth. That I will never leave you, never will I forsake you. He can do that in your life. Why? Because our God is not a dead God. He is alive. He is alive. Friends, God had solved our greatest problem about our sin by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ on the cross to die for our sins. Our problem with sin, greatest problem, cost God, His only Son, cost Jesus His very life. And yet in spite of this, the Bible tells, that, tells us that He demonstrated His love by doing this. He demonstrated His love for us. He died for us. Paul says in Romans 8, if God did not hesitate, if the God did not spare His Son, did not spare His Son by giving it to us for our salvation, Paul says, will He not also give us what we need today? What are your challenges today in life? What are your fears? What are those things that would cause you sleepless during the night? The Bible says, if God could give His one and only begotten Son, the Son of God, to die on the cross for our sins, will He not give us those needs today? Will He not leave, help us in our times of need today? If He was willing to give us His very life, will He not also give us what we need today? So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, let's continue to trust in the Lord. Let's trust Him that He is working in our situation today. We might not see it or we might not notice it at the moment, but one thing I know is that God is working he is actively working in the lives of His people. In whatever situation that we have today, He knows because He is alive. He sees, your, he sees your problems. He sees your struggles. He sees your pains. He sees your tears. He sees everything that you silently bear the pains that you bear every day. He sees it. He knows it because He is a living Lord. He is not a dead God. And He cares for us. How wonderful it is that God says, cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Our God cares for us. And these words are not just a statement or a promise for us because our God is not just a figure of our imagination. God is real. God is alive. 
and is actively working in the lives of his people. At the proper time, we will just see it in our own eyes, what he has done and what he is doing in our life. Let us continue to trust the Lord. Today, the empty tomb tells us, reminds us, or gives us this promise of confirmation about the identity of Christ that we serve the true and the living Savior, living Lord. The empty tomb also means the cancellation of our sins. As I said, a dead Savior cannot save. But this Savior, though he died, and yet he did not remain dead, he rose again from the grave. The empty tomb, the empty tomb also gives us the celebration of life eternal. Through Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection, the Bible says that we have this promise of life eternal, that there is resurrection from the grave, there is, there is reception in heaven, and there is reunion with our Savior in heaven and reunion with our loved ones who have gone ahead of us. What a promise, what a wonderful promise for us. It was said that Robert Entersoul, the skeptic, was very skeptic or rejected the belief about resurrection. But at the casket of his brother, at that time, he began to sp speculate what lies ahead after death? And he said these words. He said these words. We cry aloud, he said. And the only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. We cry aloud, and the only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. How sad for people who rejected the belief in the resurrection. How different with the words of Jesus Christ in John 11 when he said that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live again. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What a promise. What a message of hope for us believers as we celebrate our risen Lord. That he said, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though you may die, and yet you will live again. Whoever believes in me will never die die, will never remain dead. What a wonderful promise for us believers. And uh, that's what the Apostle Paul also says in, in Romans. That he says that he, when he talk about his persecutions, hardships that he had gone through, he said, why should we worry? Why should we be bothered? When we live, we live for the Lord. We, when we live, we are in the Lord's hands. And when we die, we are in the Lord's hands. Whatever, whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. That's why there's nothing to worry about this life. That's why we rejoice in the fact that our Savior, He died for our sins and He did not remain dead. But he was alive. He rose again from the grave. And that is our hope as believers of Jesus Christ. We praise God for this wonderful promise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you so much, Lord, for 
dying for us on the cross of Calvary. And we thank you, Lord, that you remain, you did not remain dead, Lord God. As what you promised, that after three days, you would rise again from the grave. Lord, indeed, Lord God, the scripture, history has proved to us, Lord God, that you rose again from the grave. Showing to us, demonstrating to us, that you are what you claim to be, a God. A God who came to this world, became a man, died for our sins, and rose again for, our, for the justification of our sins. We thank you, Lord, that we have, you have found us, Lord God, that we have you in our lives. That whatever situations we might face in this life, Lord, we thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you that you are reliable, Lord. We can depend on you, Lord, for you are a living God, a living Savior, a loving Father to us all. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. So this time, please uh, prepare uh, the elements as we prepare for our communion. Okay, so let's just uh, meditate on the message of the song. Prepare the elements and above all, prepare your heart as we have our communion celebration. God bless. this time let us come together in celebration of the Lord's Supper let us all uh, prepare our hearts and uh, I'd like to read a passage from Matthew chapter 26 starts with verse 26 Jesus, the Word of God says now as they were eating Jesus took bread and after blessing broke it and gave it 
to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We have come together uh, this morning for this celebration, the Lord's Supper, remembering the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have this in this passage that it was a time in, in the upper room where Jesus Christ met the disciples and Jesus Christ instituted the first uh, communion. And he said that he revealed during that time that he will be arrested and he will be killed. He will be betrayed and then he will be killed. And he will die for the sins of mankind. And here we know that the disciples faith will be challenged after that. But here in the upper room, before his arrest, before his death, although maybe the disciples did not understand it, but Jesus made a very, very important promise to them. He says in verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's a promise that Jesus Christ was saying to them, yes, I will be arrested, I will be betrayed, I will be arrested, I will be killed, but I will not remain dead because we will be seeing again he said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. He said, I will be killed, but death has no hold over my body. Death cannot hold him. That he would rise again from the grave. And that we will be together with him again in the Father's kingdom. It's a promise for them. And for us believers also today, in this time of trials, in this time of difficulties, in this time of pandemic, this time of fear, doubt, confusion, let's be assured that we have this Lord, this God, who is with us. As we remember His death on the cross, His sacrifice on the cross for us, we also have to remember that He, remained, he did not remain dead, that He rose again for our salvation, that He rose again for us believers. That He is with us right now. That He is among us today. That He is with His people. That He is faithful and true to His promise. That He will walk with us. That He will be with us. That He will never forsake us. That He will never leave us. That He will go with His people. So friends, as we partake of these elements as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's all remember as what he said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember who Christ is in our lives. He died for our sins. He rose again and he is living in us. He is with us today and he promised that he will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until on that day when he will drink it with us in the father's kingdom
Wow. What a wonderful promise for us believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, let us prepare our hearts as we partake of these elements. Let us search our hearts. The Bible says in First Corinthians, it says that before we partake of these elements, we have to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves before we partake of this. Or else, we'll be bringing judgment on ourselves. So let's bow down our heads this time. Let us commit our lives to Him. Commit our time together to Him this morning. Allow Him to search our hearts. If there's anything that is not pleasing before Him, bring it to the Lord. Bring it to Him. He is a forgiving God. He promised in His Word that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's do that, brothers and sisters, in the Lord this morning. Before we partake of this element, let us look at our hearts also. As we look back what Christ has done on the cross, let us also Look at our hearts today, our heart's condition. How are we? How is our walk with the Lord this morning? Are we in line with His will, with His ways, with His words? Or are we living a life that is not pleasing before Him? Let's bring it before the Lord this morning. Let's repent and come before Him for forgiveness. Father, this morning, we come to you, Lord, recognizing, Father, that there's nothing hidden in you, Lord. You see our hearts, you see our lives through and through, Lord God. You know everything about us, not just our actions, but even our intentions. You know our thoughts, our hearts. Lord, this morning, we pray, Lord God, let you search our lives, Lord. If there's anything that is not pleasing to you, Lord, oh God, we ask for your forgiveness. Cleanse us, O oh Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our sins, Lord God. Forgive us of those things that we have done that displeases, us, that dishonors your name, Lord. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge our sins. We acknowledge that you are the most holy God. Forgive us, Lord, and cleanse us. That as we partake of this element, Lord, we are worthy to partake of this. Lord, this element reminds us of your great love, of your amazing grace upon our lives. This reminds us, Lord God, of your great sacrifice on that cross of Calvary, that you gave your life for our sins. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, and make us worthy as we partake of this element. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you so much, Lord, that by your grace, by your death on the cross, you have made us partaker of your salvation. And you have given us that promise of future inheritance Enjoying the blessing of heaven in your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take hold of the bread. On the night when Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Eat, all of you. And do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake together? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
drink all of you and do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake together? Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that your love has no condition, Lord God. When we look at our lives, when we look at our sins, Lord God, we know that we are indeed undeserving people, Lord. What we deserve, the punishment, the wrath of God, the judgment. When we look at ourselves, Lord God, when we look at our lives, we see our hopeless situation, our hopeless condition. But Lord, we thank you that you came and died for us, Lord God. That while we were still in our sins, that we, while we were still rebellious, sinning against you, you came down and you went to the cross to die for our sins, Lord. What an amazing Savior we have, O oh God. What a wonderful God we have, Lord. What a great Savior we have, Lord God. What a great salvation that we have received from you, Lord. Undeserving. We are undeserving of this salvation that we have received from you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, that indeed in you, Lord, we are secured. In spite of what we have done, in spite of our past, Lord, when we respond to you in faith, when we come to you in faith, Lord God, Lord, you promise forgiveness. You promise salvation. Lord, thank you that this morning, uh, this bread reminds us, Lord, that your body was crushed, was broken on the cross of Calvary because of our sins. This blood or this wine, Lord, reminds us of your blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we receive it so freely. But Lord, it cost you your very life on the cross. Father, indeed, no way, there's no way we can ever repay, Lord, what you've done in our lives. But Lord, here's our life. Lord, use our lives for your glory and for your honor. May our lives, Lord God, day after day will bring glory and honor to your name. May our lives, Lord God, be a blessing to the people around us. May we reflect Christ in our lives. Let it be, Lord, that through our lives, Lord God, people will know God. People will see Christ through our lives, Lord God. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the great reminder of your death on the cross. Great reminder that you, Lord, did not remain dead. That you are alive. That you are risen. That you are God. That you are with your people. Lord, this morning, as we and our worship service. Lord, bless your people. Whatever challenges that your people are facing at this very moment, Lord, please come upon them. Minister to them, Lord God. Help them, Lord God, in their problems. Help them in whatever troubles, pains, struggles that they are going through at this very moment. Let them know that you are with your people. Let them know, God, that you are are faithful and true to what you promised to us. Lord, bless us, dismiss us with your blessing. 
And now, brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.